will live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So the first 10 verses of Romans 6, that's the indicatives. Those are just statements of fact. <clears throat> then when we get to verse 11, which is the anchor point, which shifts the rest of the passage, which we'll look at when we talk about progressive sanctification. But he says, okay, I said all this in these first 10 verses, all these statements of fact. Then he says, the first thing we need to do in verse 11, he said, so, so because you know all these statements of fact, you have to consider yourself, now that you know all these facts, you have to consider yourself as these facts have declared. Okay? So, firstly, Paul, in this text, in the very first verse, he asks a question. Says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Shall we continue in sin? Should we just keep sinning just because grace is available to us? Should we just keep doing whatever we want? And then in verse 2, he definitively declares, by no means. <clears throat> in the Greek, it's meganoita, which means may it never be so. It's an emphatic, like, how could you say that? God forbid, no. Some, some, some of your translations say, God forbid. He's basically making an argument. Why would you want to act that way? Just because grace is available to you. Why would you want to act that way? And then he goes on in those next few verses explaining why we shouldn't continue in sin. Okay? Now, if you were honest with yourself, you would still find yourself struggling against sin on a daily basis. Right? Right. And on occasion, sadly, you don't even struggle at all. Crickets. <laughs> on occasion, you don't, it doesn't even take a struggle. You just do it. Okay? Now, does that mean you're not a true Christian because you sin on a daily basis? No, it does not goes back to understanding this verse. <clears throat> Douglas Moo, yes, his last name is Moo, like, spelled like cow. Moo, mm -hmm. M-O-O. And his quote says, living in sin is best taken as describing a lifestyle of sin, a habitual practice of sin, such that one's life could be said to be characterized by that sin, rather than by the righteousness God requires. Such habitual sin is not possible as a constant situation for the one who has truly experienced to transfer out from under the domain or tyranny of sin. Sin's power is broken for the believer, and this must be evident in our practice. <clears throat> Yet the nature of Christian existence is such that the believer can, at times, live in such a way that is inconsistent with the reality of what God has made him in Christ. It's the gap. <clears throat> okay? When we talk about habitual sin, sin <clears throat> what's, what's really underlying it is the lack of repentance. You just do it. Don't care. There's no thought to it. And it's constant. It's just constant. Like you said, say again. No guilt. No guilt. No remorse. No turning back to God. No confession of sin. No forgiveness. No reconciliation. Nothing. Nothing changes. They just keep doing it. And when they're called on it, when they're convicted or rebuked about it, they get hostile. Like really hostile. Not like defensive. You know, sometimes we can get defensive because it stings and we get a little defensive. I'm talking about hostile, like, you don't tell me, you can't judge me, or the, the, the famous phrase, only God can judge me. Do you really want that? Yeah. <laughs> but they make these statements to get you 
because, because they love their sin. And so because they love their sin, they make those kind of statements when, when they're rebuked. Or they skin that, send that scathing, nasty email to the pastor because they were sitting under the conviction of sin the whole time when he was preaching the sermon. Or they try to justify their sin all the time. Try to make some excuse. Well, it's because of my spouse. And then all this goes back to the garden. Because what happens when they got busted by God? Adam, Adam didn't say, yeah, my bad guy. Yeah, woman. Yeah. <laughs> he said, that woman, just like Jeff said, the woman you gave me. So Adam said it was God's fault. Eve said it was the serpent's fault. The serpent said it was Satan's fault. <laughs> so everybody was blaming everybody else. Okay? And that is the difference between somebody that's struggling with their sin and somebody that's just habitually sinful and enjoys it and loves it and doesn't care to change it. That's the difference. We all struggle with sin. But the question is, are you struggling? Are you daily fighting against your sin? Are you trying to kill your flesh on a daily and regular basis? When the Holy Spirit convicts you of sin, are you running to the Father and confessing your sins at the mercy seat? And receiving the grace and forgiveness from Him? Turning back to God in repentance? Are you doing that? So all of our progress and actual change depends on this new relationship to Christ. He is in us and we are in him. In Christ, we have died to sin and are now alive to righteousness. That's what the text is saying. We read that. Okay. Jesus has not just given us a ticket to heaven. There's a lot of people that think that when they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and they repented of their sins, now they can just sit back and wait until they die or Jesus comes back and they're automatically going to heaven. The gospel is not fire insurance. It's not fire insurance. It is assurance, but it's not insurance. Not in the sense of Insurance, like I can sit back and do nothing type of insurance. But Ephesians does tell us that we have been sealed by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. But up until that point, we're just to be working on this gap. Right? There are people who will stay right here and not do anything and not change and they will stand before God and he will say depart from me I never knew you you worker of lawlessness so the difference between somebody who truly understands the gospel and somebody who's treating it as a ticket to heaven is are they progressing are they maturing So you will not only experience deep and lasting change as the Holy Spirit applies the resources of the gospel. I'm, excuse me. I added a word there. You will only experience deep and lasting change as the Holy Spirit applies the resources of the gospel to your heart and life. Remember all those terms we talked about, like reconciliation and triumph and redemption. And all? The Holy, as the Holy Spirit applies those things to your life, and as he gives you greater understanding of those things, you grow in sanctification. Because that, remember, one of the affections of the heart was zeal. Your zeal will increase because you understand what Christ did better. Then you understand what it means to be in Christ. So as you understand these indicatives, these statements of fact, then you can start to carry them out as the Holy Spirit works in you. So union with Christ is the basis of holiness, not the goal of holiness. So being in Christ is not something you have to achieve. Okay? You don't do good, godly things to be in Christ. You're already in Christ. We read in Colossians in our uh, responsive reading today, what did it say? Our lives were hidden in Christ. Right. 
Your life is Christ's life. Christ's life is your life. So you're not performing trying to be in Christ. You're automatically there. You're already there. God has placed you there in Christ. That's what uh, Romans 6, when we read, was talking about being baptized into his death and being baptized into his life. Okay? We are experiencing the positional aspect of being sanctified. It's just a gap. This doesn't change. Because you know from your own life, you go like this. <laughs> you know <laughs> from, from, from your own life, if you took an inspection of your own life, you know what's up and down. So we call the what 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 they call in the black church the, the vicissitudes of life, the ups and downs of life. It's like a roller coaster. Think you're going along good, wham, sin hits, and you go back a few steps and you go. It's a constant war. You know how you call that? No, <laughs> uh, you like that word? <laughs> Got me curious. Vicissitudes. So this doesn't change. Your position doesn't change at all. <laughs> Playing music pins. <laughs> I'll get it. No, I'll get it. You get it. No, I'll get it. Positional. Positional sanctification. This doesn't change. Progressive is what changes. Okay? You're getting more and more Christ like. Let me phrase that. You should be getting more and more Christ like every day. Getting closer and closer to that perfection. Being more and more holy. So union with Christ is the basis of your holiness, not the goal. Because you are now regenerated, justified, and sanctified, you can walk in newness, righteousness, and holiness. Not the other way around. It's not you walk in newness, righteousness, and holiness, and then you're regenerated justified and sanctified. It's backwards. That's what you call, that's called works righteousness. Works righteousness is where you read your Bible in a year and that makes you more holy. Or you pray every day consecutively for a month and that gives you regeneration. It's like you do, if you perform these certain things, then I'll give you some reconciliation. And then when you do a little more, when you, when you have a better relationship with your spouse, I'll give you a little more reconciliation. And then when you when you fail in your relationship with your spouse, I'll give you, I'll take some of that reconciliation. No, that's not how it works. You are regenerated, you are justified, you are reconciled, you have been redeemed. You are sanctified. You do have triumph. Okay? You do have the Holy Spirit indwelling you. You have Christ's righteousness imputed to you. All of those things we talked about, it's already there. You're working from those things. Okay? You're not. And, and some people, they hear us teach it this way and they think, well, we're robots. That's not what we're saying. It's not what we're saying. We're not saying you're robots. Like, the reason why you read your Bible is because God made you read it. That's not, it's not in that sense of force. Like, he's forcibly making you more like Christ. No, he's working within you, changing those things within you that prevent you from doing the things of God so that you will respond and do those things. It's not a forcible thing. It's a more of a persuasive moving towards. And then you yield to that. Right. Right. Which is in our next section anyway. So now we got the position, right? So now we're going to see how to apply these things. I'm going to erase this because i got to write some stuff up here. So 
I wrote down the, the, the party, the party word to show off to your friends. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so the Scrabble word. Yeah. Just, oh. oh wow. You that get a lot of points for that one. That would be a good one. <laughs> so how do we apply? teach them how to apply it. Like, how do I apply redemption to my life? How do I apply regeneration? How do I apply justification? That's why we do the doctrine and then we do the application. Okay? So how do we apply the gospel resources to our lives in, in, the, in the case of sanctification? Well, it's all in Romans 6, so you should still be there. So the first one is Count on it. So, when I touched on this briefly when I finished reading it, verse 11 says, basically, now that I've said all of these things in verse 10, in the first 10 verses, now, what does he say? So you also must what? Consider yourselves. Consider yourselves. So the first thing, and how do you apply gospel resources to your life in order for sanctification to take place? You gotta consider them. If you don't ever think about the gospel, what good is it doing for you? How does it help you if you don't ever meditate on it? Think about it. Okay. So in this case from what he was talking about in the first 10 verses, what he's talking about here, about considering yourselves dead to sin and alive to God, you have to first recognize your death to sin in Christ is an already accomplished fact. You don't do things to become dead to sin. You already are. So when you put that in your mind, it helps you to walk in holiness. Because your identity is not defined by the sins of your past. You got a lot of people in the church who live with regret. They keep looking back at what they did. And now all of a sudden the guilt and the remorse comes back for something that happened 10 years ago. No, you're dead to sin. You're not defined by what you did in the past. You're defined by your position. You're defined by what God says about you. God says you're in Christ. God says you're holy. God says you're his child. God says you, you are sanctified. God says you're justified. God says you're a son and a daughter. God says you're, you're in his kingdom. All these things that God says about you, you need to consider them. Your identity is defined by the righteousness and obedience of Jesus Christ because he obeyed and followed the law perfectly. So you trust that the same result will happen to you at some point. Which of course will be when you die or go to heaven. Because I love church history and I've never read any biography of or, or autobiography of a child of God who's perfect on the face of the earth. This didn't happen. Okay? So though you are not, and this is encouraging because though you are not yet as much like Jesus as you someday will be, you are not the same person you used to be. So when you when 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 your mind tries to bring up your past, you look at where you are now. Say, I'm not there anymore. You don't 
go back and then have all this guilt and remorse again. You say, no, I'm not that anymore. I'm this. Because God is working in me. And he has brought me from death to life. That's what the, uh, the writer of Amazing Grace song, I forget his name, but uh, John Newton. Newton. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's what he said. I remember Eric saying before that I'm not what I hope to be, but I'm not what I'm not supposed to be. Yeah. You know, I, I say phrases from the black church a lot, but I, that's where I spent most of my life. You know, I ain't where I used to be. I ain't, I ain't where I'm, uh, well, how's it go? I ain't where I need to be, but thank God I ain't where I used to be. And then the whole world, everybody, ah! I'm doing it on the inside. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> you are dead to sin, and alive to God. Verse 11, you need to consider that. You're dead to sin and alive to God. So, first you count on it. And all of these instructions, you know how you get these sermons where they give you all these steps and most of them are more like psychological or philosophical, they're not really biblical. Every step that you're getting in these lessons comes straight from scripture. So you can't say, oh, we can't do that, that doesn't make sense or anything. No, it's coming straight from in this case, coming straight from Romans 6. So the next one is do not looks like do not space there. Do not let sin reign. Do not let sin reign. And that is verse 12. See, everything's coming out of this passage. Verse 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Since we're dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus, we must not allow sin to control our actions. So though your old self is crucified, this doesn't mean the battle with sin is over. Because if it was, you'd be what? Perfect. Sin still wages war against your soul. It assaults your thoughts and your senses with passions and it demands that you bow to it. It demands that you succumb to it, that you give in to it. The old slave master still insists on your obedience, but you cannot let sin rule your life. And this raises an important question. Does the believer still have a sinful nature? Well, that all depends on how you define the term. Okay? It is clear from Scripture that the believer still wars against the flesh. See that in Galatians 5, where it talks about the, the works of of evil, the works of sin, the works of the flesh, and then it goes into the fruit of the spirit and it contrasts the two and it, and it tells you that the flesh is always warring against the spirit. There is a war going on, okay? It's clear that we still contend against the flesh, against sinful inclinations, passions, and desires. Some teachers view the flesh as a static, unchanging principle within the believer that constantly struggles against the spirit for control in the believer's life. Right? This is the one, the one side. So, as long as the believer is filled with the spirit, the power of sin is counteracted. And the Christian can live a victorious life completely free from all conscious and willful sin. Believers who, and, and this, is, this is how they're defining it, okay? Notice I said completely. There's a problem with that, isn't there? I saw you guys go, wait a minute. So that means you're, you're listening and thinking. The next thing they say is that believers who continue to struggle with sin are living in defeat, which is a problem because we looked at triumph and we defined triumph the other in that second lesson, remember? Okay? 
They're living in defeat because they pursue holiness in the energy of the flesh rather than abiding in Christ and being filled with the Spirit. This teaching fails in three ways. Firstly, it fails to grasp the extensive scope of transformation that results from union with Christ. All these things that we're looking at in these 12 weeks is the, com the complete and total transformation that has taken place in us because of what Christ did. That, their argument makes it seem like he didn't do enough. And there's still some things left that we need to do. Okay. Secondly, it fails to recognize that even mature and spiritual believers will continue to fight against sin throughout their lives. You're always going to be fighting. You can be 95 years old. There's still some sin you're going to be fighting with in your life. It's a fight to the death, literally. You're going to be fighting against your sin until you die or, or until Jesus comes back. Okay. And thirdly, it fails to recognize what we just talked about, the victory Christ gained on the cross for believers. If I can live defeated, then Christ didn't gain victory for me. This is remember putting the cart before the horse. They put the cart before the horse. No, Christ gained victory over my enemies. Satan, the demonic, sin, flesh, the world. He gained victory over all that on the cross. So because I'm in Christ, I share in that victory. I'm not defeated. I sin, but I'm not defeated. I'm at war. See the difference? Okay? And actually another argument is, another problem with it is that it makes sin equal to the Holy Spirit. It makes sin just as powerful as the Holy Spirit. Which contradicts what Paul said in verse 11. Consider yourselves what? Dead to? If you're dead to sin, it doesn't have the same power that the Holy Spirit has in your life. Okay. So, to live in line with your new identity, you must say no to sin. It's like that whole campaign, say no to drugs. Remember that? Say no to sin. It's an active statement. You're not. It goes back to what we were talking about, that, that tick to heaven. You're not passive in this. Although God is working in you, you're not passive in it. God, is, God in his grace empowers you to say no to sin. You're not passive. It's not like, you know, the, the Wizard of Oz and then you look behind the curtain and there's God controlling you. It's not that kind of thing. Okay? So, you have to count on it. Consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God. You cannot let sin reign in your life. Next. And just popped into my head. Think about it. This whole defeated, victorious thing, it primarily happens and occurs in, in like Pentecostal charismatic churches. Where if you're struggling with your bills, you're living a defeated life. Or if your marriage isn't, if you're not getting along your marriage and fighting, you're living in a defeated marriage. Or if you don't come to church, you're a defeated Christian. Or, you know, when you sin, you're lacking faith. Or all these other so basically, whenever things ain't going right, you're, in, you're living a defeated life. But that contradicts Romans 8. Romans 8, doesn't it? Which says that all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. So, actually, 
when your marriage is a little sour, it's actually for your good. There's a victory that comes through in the end. We looked at those cycles today. Okay, there's a victory. There's a silver lining in that dark cloud. There's a light at the end of the tunnel. Okay? <clears throat> so, you count on it, you do not let sin reign, and you yield to your new master. And this is verses 13 through 23. Okay? Now, Romans 6. It says, do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life. There it is again. That goes back to verse 11. Considering yourself dead to sin and alive to God. Okay? It says, Present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law but under grace. Okay? So the presentation is on your is your part. Who are you presenting yourself to? Are you presenting yourself to sin so that your instruments, instruments means your body parts, so that your instruments can be used for unrighteous reasons? Or are you presenting yourself to God so that your body can be used for righteous reasons? You, through the power of the Holy Spirit, yield yourself to your new master. It goes to verse 15. He says, What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. There's that meganoita again, that God forbid. May it never be so. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death? or of obedience which leads to righteousness. So what does he call us in this text? He calls us slaves. We're either slaves to sin or we're slaves to righteousness. And that is determined by who we submit ourselves to. So when we submit to sin, we submit to slave, slave to sin. When we submit to God and we do Godly things, we're submitting to righteousness. Okay? But either way, you're a slave. You have a master. This is why free will doesn't work. Because free will, when you have when you define free will, you, free will means that you yourself are not affected by anything outside of you. It means that no external thing can change your disposition at all. The other term is autonomous. You're autonomous. You're self-control. You're not. We just saw that right there. You're not. Now, do you have a will? Yes. And this is where people get upset with the whole free will thing. But they misunderstand the argument. I'm not saying you don't have a will. We're not saying you don't make choices. But those choices are driven by one of two masters. Either sin in your flesh or God in his righteousness and the Holy Spirit. Okay? So when you do sinful things, it's because you were being driven by your master over there. When you do godly things, it's because you're being driven. Your will is not free. It's, 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 it's free in the sense of some of the choices you make. Like what you're going to put on when you go to work. But when it comes down to this, your will is bound to sin or righteousness. So in this sense, it's not free. Okay? 
right? So, we continue on, verse 17, he says, But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and, have been, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. You know, we can't, he had to, he had to paint the picture in, in human terms because it's just hard to grasp. Okay? Not that we're stupid or anything. He's not saying, oh, you're stupid. He's just saying, if I explained it in this really deep spiritual way, it would have just been mind blowing. So I had to explain it in human terms. This is why we, when we preach or we teach, we paint things with human analogies, to try to help you to understand. Or we, or we paint it from experience, like you know, Tammy and Jeff did this and that and other, and this is why this and this is why this is this and that. And then you go, oh, okay, okay, that makes sense now. Trying to bring those spiritual principles down to so that you can apply them. But if we just leave them up here on the highest shelf, you'll never get the cookies. Okay. So he says, for just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. This is the progression. You see the contrast here. When you were slaves to impurity and lawlessness and sin and the flesh, all you could do was just keep presenting it to become more and more lawless. You just kept sinning. You just kept doing it. You kept doing it. Because what does sin do? When you sin, sin says, oh, that was good, but I want more. So what do you do? You give it more. And then sin says, eh, still not satisfied, I want some more. So you give it some more. And you just keep doing it. And now, you look back, and the stuff you thought you would never do, now you're doing it. Because sin is always going to require more of you than you can actually offer it. Until you get to the point where you, you, you self-destruct and destroy yourself. But now on the other side, you do it the same thing. Keep committing those righteous acts and you grow from, you close that gap. And you experience the godliness that takes place in your life. You know, you and your spouse are getting along better. You're not arguing as much or, you know, you're, you're being an example on your job or, or you're, you're rightly dividing the word when you preach or teach or, or you're doing more service to God, those things, because God is working in you first. That zeal is building up in you, and you want more of the righteous. And so now you're getting closer and closer to that perfect Christ-likeness. Okay? So, verse 20, he says, For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. The point he's making there is that when you were a slave to sin, you... You couldn't do righteous things. You could do good. You could help a little old lady across the street, but you couldn't do things that God requires because you were a slave to sin. That's what he's saying. This goes all. This all goes back to the argument that your will is not totally free. It's being driven by something outside of you or inside of you. In the case of the believer, the Holy Spirit. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. Now that we're walking in righteousness, now that we're living holy lives before God, and we look back on the sins that we committed, we're like, what was I thinking when I did all that? And even when we sin now, it's, it's temporary, it's fleeting. But when we turn this way and we walk in righteousness and we do righteous things before God, we see the long-lasting effects of these things. These are eternal principles that we're living in and we're practicing. This is temporary sin. Mm -hmm. It's fleeting. You get your pleasure from it. You get your desire from it. You get satiated for a minute. 
and then it wears off and now you gotta do it again. This doesn't wear off. This just keeps on going. It keeps growing and growing into better and better and better things. Cause you look back at you, I now I look back and I'm like, oh my goodness, what was that doing? Because now I see how beautiful the treasures are over here in righteousness and godliness. So now I look back this way, it's like, what in the world was I thinking about? He says, but now, verse 22, now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. That's what I was just saying. These things lead to eternity. A beautiful one too for the wages of sin is death but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord the free the wages of sin is death you know how you we all we get up in the morning and we go to work and we punch the clock and then at the end of the day you clock out and then whether you're paid you know weekly or bi-weekly then, at the end of the week, we'll use the weekly example. You punch in Monday through Friday. At the end of the week, what do you get? Paycheck. Paycheck. Same thing with sin. You're just punching the clock. Punching the clock. Increasing your payment to God. Increasing your debt to God. You just keep increasing. Notice the contrast here. Sin costs. Grace is free. That kind of goes back up to this first one, doesn't it? When you consider that. Sin costs. You're going to pay for it. In the end, when you stand before God, He's going to require payment from you. And that check that you couldn't, that, you know how they say you wrote a check, you couldn't cash. That's what's happening. You're going to pay for every last cent of sin that you commit if you're not in Christ when you stand before God. The wages of sin is death. Not just physical death but spiritual death in the end. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Why is it free? Paid for it. Who paid for it? Christ did on the cross. Christ paid for it on the cross. So you don't owe God anything anymore. Your debt has been cleared and canceled because of Christ. Because you're in Christ, you don't owe God anything anymore. The only thing you really owe God is your, your devotion, your loyalty, your life. Gratitude. Gratitude. Just the, the things that stem from walking in righteousness. That's what you owe God. But as far as a payment is concerned, you don't owe God anything. Mm -hmm. It's paid for. Because Christ did what he get, did, then he can say, here, Karen, here's eternal life for you. No charge. Is that tied back to justification? Right? Mm-hmm. Uh, all of this, this is just one big puzzle. You know, like I said, we've got the edges. Now we're just putting everything in it. By the time we get to the end of week 12, you'll see the whole picture. And it'll just, it'll just all make sense. But right now, we're just putting it together. I believe we're halfway through. I know, it's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so, freedom from one master always entails service to another. This goes back to the whole free will thing. You, if you're free from one master, you're serving another. God makes that, Jesus makes that clear in Matthew. He said you can't serve two masters. Mm -hmm. You either serve one, you love one and hate the other. You hate one and love the other. I know you say you can't serve God and mammon, which they say is money, but it could be God and whatever over here. You can't serve God and sin. You're either a slave to one or a slave to the other. 
Okay? And all the various expressions of human sinfulness are rooted in an alternative slavery. It's a different kind of slavery. A, we suffer over here. The suffering over here is different. We suffer because Christ suffered. But it's different. It's a suffering for his glory. This is a suffering just because you're just doing stupid stuff. <laughs> it's a difference. There's no benefit over here in your suffering. Over here in your suffering, there's great benefit because it glorifies God. And it shows that you're in Christ. We got a lesson on suffering, too. Because we don't suffer well. In our minds, we just want everything to be beautiful because, because we're saved. We think the saved life, and part of this because leaders paint it this way, we think the saved life is just beautiful and skipping and picking tulips and roses and <laughs> smelling and looking at the sun and dancing. And, no. No. It's a war over here. Are there times where you dance and smell? Yeah. Then there's times when you're swinging and punching because sin is on you. Throwing elbows and doing Muay Thai and MMA. You're in the octagon sometimes. <laughs> so one of the common denominators in all slaveries to sin is their dehumanizing effect. Sin makes you look like an animal. That's what it means, dehumanizes you. It makes you look like an animal. Because humanity is defined by how God defined it when he said, let us make man in our image and after our likenesses. So if we're not acting in his image and after his likeness, we're not acting human. So when you see abortion and genocide, it's because people, because of sin, they think less of other people. Oh, we just wipe this nation out because they're just taking up space and we need the land. Right, right. Oh, those Christians, they dehumanize us. They dehumanize us too. They try to flip it, make us look like we're nuts. And they're the humans. Oh, you're just following this, this person you can't see. You guys are idiots, stupid. The Bible says they're going to call us that. They think we're morons. But we know the truth. Because we understand now what it means to be created in the image of God and his likenesses. And so, in his likeness. And so we're working on those relationships, man to man, man to God, man to nature. And we're improving them. And we're treating people like they are made in the image of God. Whereas over here in the world, the sin, they're treating people like they're just nothing. You got gang violence. It's just kids killing each other over land that doesn't even belong to them. Been there, done that. 59th Street and 5th Avenue didn't belong to me. It belonged to the to the uh, realtors and the state and whoever else it belonged to. It didn't belong to me. But I sure was putting my tag up there. This is my hood. You come in my hood. You better not be wearing red. You're going to get shot killed. Dehumanizing. When I sold drugs. It's dehumanizing. It's making people dumb. It's smoking weed. If you've ever smoked weed, you know how it makes you feel. You're just like, mm -hmm. it's dehumanizing. Sin makes us less of humans than we are designed to be. So the more a person is enslaved, the less likely they are to be a well-adjusted human being within the connection of relationships to God, people, and the world that makes for a joyful life. So the more that sin drags you down, the less able you are to fulfill those three relationships, man to man, man to God, man to nature. You will have less 
and less regard for those relationships. You won't try to do anything to repair them, to fix them, because your, your mind just starts to not care anymore. There's no joy over here. Yeah, I mean, you go out, you know, me, just, just me and Jeff for an example, and we went out and we hung out and we had a couple pictures and we was feeling nice and we was having a good time. Yeah, in our, in our minds at the time, yeah, that was good, we had a good time, man. But according to the scripture, that was miserable over here. That's misery. <laughs> and misery loves company. So Christ, on the other hand, leads his followers down the path of generosity and contentment, chastity and marital fidelity, servanthood and humility. And the truest freedom that anybody can experience is found in a new kind of slavery, which is slavery to Christ. When you start to live your life according to Christ's example, you see things in a whole new light. Those sunsets aren't just beautiful sunsets. God did that. And you might even break out into a song. You know, like how great thou art. You know? When you see other human beings, like in these third world countries, suffering because of the tyranny of some leader, you weep, you grieve because they're not being treated like human. That man-to-man -man relationship has been distorted because of sin. You see everything differently. You watch, go back to Jeff's example, you watch the football game and you see that man make that amazing catch and he's just like, his body's all contorted and he still catches the ball and then it's, you go, oh man, what a catch! And then you go, Man, God made that body to contort so he could catch that. You watch Infinity War, Avengers, and you get some godly principle out of it. <coughs> so I'm saying it changes how you look at things, it changes how you hear things, it changes how you think about things when you're in Christ. And that transformation should be taking place every day. The good news is that if you are joined to Christ, you have been set free from sin's dominion. Sin no longer has power over you. The bondage of sin has been broken in your life. And the reign of sin has been thwarted. All we need. So what's the takeaway from this? One sentence. If you don't remember anything else I said, remember this one sentence. Amen. If you don't remember anything else I said today, if you remember this, all the rest of it falls in place. All I need is Christ alone. Pastor Eric kind of touched on that in the sermon today. How if I'm looking at my wife to fulfill me or do these things, then she's going to disappoint me. But if I look to Christ, then however she, whatever she does, I'm still going to love her the same. I'm still going to do what I need to do for her, whatever, because this is what I need. Ultimately, this is what I need. You know, so if I act contrary, if she's got this in her mind, her response is different. That's what he's talking about, that one cycle. It's, it, it's, it's all about Christ. It's not about me or Jeff or Matthew or Karen. Pat, Carlton, Dion. It's not about any of us. 
Our lives are now in Christ, so it's all about him. What we need is him. And the gospel tells us that we have everything that we need in Christ. So the question you have to ask yourself is, why am I looking elsewhere to find it? Why, when I have that, why when I have that argument with my, my family member, I go to the bar and throw a few back? Or why when I'm depressed do I just binge eat? Looking for love in all the wrong places. There you go. <laughs> That's basically the answer. You're looking for solutions where there is no solution. You're looking for solutions where it's just going to go, here's a band-aid, keep moving, bye. You'll be back to me later because you know you like this. You know you like this ice cream when you're depressed. You, you'll be back. That's what the ice cream saying to you. You'll be back. That's what the alcohol is saying to you. Well, I can't wait till y'all have another fight because you'll be right back at this bar, buddy. That's not the answer. Everything we need is in Christ. So when you're at odds in the three relationships, man to man, man to God, man to uh, nature, the answer is Christ. His death is ours. Therefore, we're free from sin. His resurrection is ours. Therefore, we walk in newness of life. We don't need to add anything to what Christ has done for us. We simply need to believe the gospel, which is what we're working through, and apply it more deeply. To We need to sink our roots more deeply in the gospel. The only way you do that is by studying your word, Coming to church and hearing the proclamation of the word, coming to your equipping classes on Sunday and learning from there, and, and Wednesday night, coming there and learning. It's the constant learning. Because the, when Jesus said the word disciple, disciple doesn't mean follower. On the surface, it means follower. But in the Greek, methetes, it actually means student. So you're not just somebody that's just, are you going that way? Oh, are you going that way? You're not just following. You're following him, and you're like, oh, wait, wait, stop, stop. Why'd you go that way? Tell me why you went that way, Jesus. I went that way because of this. Oh, okay. Wait, wait, why'd you go that way? Oh, let me tell you why I went that way. You're learning. A student, a true disciple is always a student of the word of God. And never stop being a student of God's word. Doesn't matter how many times you've read it through. Doesn't matter how familiar you are with the passage of the scriptures. You look at it again with fresh eyes because you might have missed something or you see something else in it. We should never get comfortable with the word of God like we know it. Because none of us has mastered it. I guarantee you, if I asked you to tell me what Nahum is about, you probably couldn't tell me, could you? Mm -hmm. If we haven't mastered it, so we need to study it constantly. Right? So all I need is Christ alone. And that ends our time today. Next week, we're going to talk about holiness. I told you we were going to get there and we're going to find that. So next week we're going to talk about holiness. In order to understand what it means for us to be holy, we must first understand what it means for God to be holy. So when we understand God's holiness, then we look, then we look at our holiness. It looks a whole lot different. So have a great week. I hope you continue to grow in this and learn it and apply it to your lives. And I hope you see the benefits of the gospel more and more each day in your life. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you. Thank you.